Hey up YouTube, how you doing? Um, right, I think it's about time we started the um, Russ Gets Preachy series. No, I'm kidding. This is hopefully going to be far from anything preachy. Um, I'm going to talk to you about... Primarily it's what I wish I'd done in hindsight, so what I wish I'd done um, before I took on um, the, the, the plot. Uh, and you know what what I've done and what made what's made life easier what I've learnt you know I'm not going to tell you how to do things that's not the plan for conversation shared or for, for me at all my 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 plan is just for, for for it to be an information source for you and um take from it what you will you know um I don't do things by any sense of the imagination I don't do things conventionally I don't follow old rules necessarily and I don't make my own rules necessarily um, so I'm going to run you through some of the things that I wish I'd done or I wish I knew um, since I started so we're literally going to start from from day one so we're going to look at the type of things you should be asking and the, um, the video I'm going to try and keep short but the type of things you should be asking when you go to view your allotment. So you've had the call from your committee or your council or whomever, parish council, that they've got a plot or some plots available. Do you want to go and pick one? So, you know, off your trot and um, to have a look at the site. And, you know, there are, there are some things that are handy to know at that stage with regards to each plot. Um, and regards to the site as a whole, uh, there are, and I've even done a plan for this video to try and keep the length down. <laughs> um, private, a lot of these may or may not depend on yourself and your circumstance. So for example, what facilities does the site have? Does it have a toilet? Does it have a locked gate? Is it hidden access? Is it limited access? Um, you know, can you drive in there? Is there a car park? You know, things like that. Facilities, so toilets. Um, if there's a committee, is there a clubhouse? Um, is there somewhere where you can go and make tea and coffee? Is there somewhere where you can go throw 10p in a pot for a coffee? Um, things like that. Is there electricity? Is there water? How close is the water to the plots that you're looking at? Um, if there isn't water, is anything provided for you to collect water? Are IBCs provided? Are um, water bus provided? Things like that. Um, you know, because if, if these things aren't provided, you need to factor them into your first budget because, of course, you can plant all the things you want, but if you can't water them, especially things like tomatoes, um, succulents, things like... Um, Cucumbers, melons, chilies, although chilies don't require a lot of water. Um, if you can't water them, they're not going to grow. So, you know, you need to know about your access to water. You know, how if there's a if there's a tap, how far is it from your plot? Are you allowed to run a hose to that tap? Some allotments don't allow it. Um, so all sort of those things matter. You know, if there is no tap, how are you going to get water to your plot? Um, you know, bear in mind your own capabilities. Uh, if you've been digging for four or five hours and you've put some plants in, you've then got to carry a couple of gallons of water, you know, two or three times. It's, it's tiring work. You know, point number one, in fact, could have been cancel your gym membership. You're not going to need it. Um, and once again, this next one, is definitely subjective it is the site family friendly it was certainly a question that mattered to me um, being a family man we've got two kids some sites they're all about professionalism and, and show veg and they can be very competitive I'm not going to sort of say there's there's anything on towards but they can be very competitive and those sort of sites tend to frown on families which in my opinion and it's just my opinion is very, very wrong. Families are the next generation of growers. They, they should be looking to support these people more than anything else, especially with the world as it is and people not knowing where their food comes from. 
all you need to do is have a little bit of knowledge if you join some of these Facebook groups and I'm not belittling these people um, it's simply gaps in knowledge um, but there are people who ask you know do tomatoes turn ripe on the vine or do I pick them when they're green you know there are people that ask what's this and it's a cucumber um, but because it doesn't look long slim and slender like the ones in the supermarkets they're a bit unsure and they're perfectly valid questions and I'm certainly not going to knock anybody for asking them but I think you know to bring it full circle to have allotment sites that are saying oh we're not going to have families because we want our site to be quiet and professional it's an allotment it's not Kew Garden um, and hell even Kew Garden's open to the kids so I disagree but you know for, for a lot of people out there um, it's a very very important question and then we sort of lead on to to, to the to the plots themselves, to the plots on the site that you're looking at. So, you know, does anybody there, I mean, if you're shown around by the council, chances are they're not gonna know, but if you're shown around by the committee or um, a local representative for the plot, they may well have the answer to some of these questions. So, you know, as you're looking at your plots, ask the person who's shown you around, if possible, ask um, plot neighbors. What's the soil like? Is it heavy? Is it peaty does it retain water does it flood um Mikhail, <laughs> the guy who does uh, rod and pollocks he took a plot and unfortunately in winter he discovered that it pretty much turns into a pond um with anything above mi mid level rain um thankfully he's managed to get a big one and hopefully we'll tie this series in with his which is going to be him clearing a quite large overgrown plot but what's the soil like? Is it heavy? Is it sandy? Is it water retentive? Does it flood? Um, how fertile is it? Um, you know, don't be put off. If you look at a plot and it's covered with weeds that, you know, taller. I mean, when we went to go look at our first plot, one of the kids went on to the plot. We actually lost her in the weeds. They were that overgrown. Um, but what it, what it shows is the soil is, is very fertile. I mean, nature always finds a way. And if nothing can grow there, it's not, you know, if you've got, if you're looking at a plot and you ask the guy, how long has it been vacant for? And he says five years, and it's still mud. He's either lying to you or the soil's dead. Which isn't a reason not to take the plot. It's a reason to do some homework in how you're gonna bring that back. Which, will be another one in the series. Um, it's something I kind of have had to deal with, not completely barren soil, but certainly soil that was nutrient deficient. Um, and then on to the next one. So, you know, what is and isn't allowed on plots? Um, take mine, for example, you're allowed a shed, a greenhouse, a chicken coop, you pretty much have free reign. But there are some sites out there that allow nothing, not a jot. You're not allowed a shed, you're not allowed a greenhouse, a polytunnel, anything. And in fact, there are even some sites out there that don't allow raised beds. Um, you know, the traditional way of doing an allotment plot is essentially, you've got essentially a rectangle of land, you till or turn over or dig over the entire plot of land so that essentially you've just got a, a, a rectangle of soil and then you decide, right, okay, so I'm going to um, plant potatoes in this section. I'm going to plant corn in this section. Um, I'm going to put beetroot in here. Um, but then, I don't know, that, that, that's enough anyway. And you, you know, you're not even allowed to border these beds. Um, with with wood or, or or anything like that, and all they become is is trodden paths. Of course, the beauty of that, of course, is that these paths can be moved every year. You're not you're not set, but you know there are some sites out there where this is the maximum. And I'm not. It's not even construction, but this is the maximum amount of setting you can do. And then, like I said, there are sites like mine where you can have anything you want. 
the only rule on mine is that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't park or you're not allowed to park a vehicle on the plot which when I first started actually made little to no sense to me but then when I took my second plot and the gentleman had been parking his vehicle on there um, you know you and, and I rotivate but you, you you're going along with your rotivator then you hit where that car's been parked and you just go the rotivator just goes boom just pulls you because the the ground has been compacted by the vehicle parking on it and, and sitting on it um, of course, I mean there are other things you could argue. There's a, there's a small fire risk um, if you've been driving a long time and you pull onto your plot. It's dry. It's overgrown. You, in theory, could start a fire under your vehicle. You know, nobody wants that. Um, but to, you know, if you're allowed a shed, is there any limits on the side of a shed? Same with a greenhouse. Same with a polytunnel. Um, yeah, are you allowed to use? Are you allowed, for example, to use concrete to set any fence posts that you want to put in? Um, things like these do matter. They may not matter to you from day one, and a lot of them will be outlined in your contract um, for, for for the allotment. But it's it's handy to know ahead of time. Because if you're if you're going to take a plot and you're thinking, great, I'm going to whack a fence up round it, and I'm going to, and I'm not, it's not a, a barrier, but I want a fence um, as a trellis, and, it's, and things are going to grow up it, or I'm going to put my raspberries against it, or things like that. It's handy to know how you can foot that in, because it that depends on what you make your fence out of. Um, and then the next one, sort of, we've kind of already touched on it, is fires and burning. Uh, once again, my site, it's it's completely banned. Um, it's just because of the city has a, a clean air policy. Um, but other allotment sites, you're allowed to burn all year round. Some certain times of year, some certain times of day. Um, it's, it is, once again, handy to know because you'd be surprised how much waste is generated. And I mean, God forbid, but if you end up with blight on your potatoes or your tomatoes, the most effective way to help you control that is to burn the, um, the affected plants as quickly as possible. Because um, technically you're not allowed to take them to a, to a landfill, um, at least so I'm told. So what you know? What are you to do with them? You can't compost them because then that compost becomes infected with blight. So what do you do? You uh, you burn them, or at least you hope you can. Now there is one loophole. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it is countrywide, and I'm talking regards to at least Britain, if not the whole UK, uh, and that's the 5th of November bonfire night. Um, I believe that the, there is a loophole. On that one night, so you can't, you're not supposed to be able to go either side of it. You're not supposed to say, Oh, well, 5th of November falls on a Wednesday, but I'm going to do it on a Saturday. No, that, that, that doesn't count. Um, you know, your, your loophole is that on the 5th of November, you can have a fire on your land. Um, but do bear in mind that if it has been put in your contract that that is overruled and you've signed that contract, you are beholden to the rules of that contract. So do bear that in mind, but the ability to have fires is important. Um, so, so it is a question worth asking. But those are the sort of, the very brief, very short answer answers you want before you start. So just a quick recap, depending on my editing skills, I'm gonna try and do a list sort of over on this side of the screen, it's why I'm sat off to one side. So. Your first questions are, what facilities are they? Is the site family friendly? What is the soil condition? What type of soil is it? What buildings am I allowed on my plot? And are fires allowed? So once you've got that, if you're happy with everything you've seen and you're happy with the answers to the questions, you move on to the next stage. Now some of you will say, great, dig. No, don't plan go home and have a, have a have a cup of tea have your dinner and have a sleep 
your head's going to be racing. You're going to be thinking of all this wonderful stuff you're going to grow. Plan. Plan what you're going to do. Even if... You know, I mean, that was... That was the first plan I ever drew. Uh, and that was... The first plan. Sorry, it's upside down. Not that it really matters. And that was... That was just the plan that I was going to do for my raised beds on one side of my plot. Um, and even that, as basic as it is, was a big, big help. I then moved on to do... Uh, I'm going to open the file. And then I moved on to doing things like this. So this is where we started. I then went on to something like this. Now this has been overdrawn and rehashed because crops have changed. You see the same beds, a bit better drawing. Um, but on that, obviously I've got a bit of planting guide on there. That's one half of my plot. And then this last year, this was my plan for the other side of the plot. Once again, you know, I know it's probably the wrong way around, but there we go. And that is that was my growing space. That doesn't include sort of my, my fixtures, so my uh, my shed, my greenhouse, um, which I don't class as a, as a growing space. Um, and I won't be doing it my next year's plan because I think my greenhouse is just going to become a seed... Uh, a, a, a seed storage, germination sort of thing. Uh, and then we've got other things, you know, like when I've decided to do a fence around the plot, which if you're a follower of the channel, you'll be seeing. So it was all measured and accounted for. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's sort of the overall size of the plot, um, which is what I wish I'd done first. I mean, I did measure the plot, but I never actually mapped it. Um, so, that's that. Um, and sort of, once again, just very, very roughly, that's the overall drawing of the two plots. So we've got, you know, the polytunnel you've seen, the, the peak cage which has now been taken down, the beds, the trees, the compost bins, some more trees, things like that. So I know where I have and haven't got space and because, and the, re the other reason I use this graph paper, if I show you, uh, let me think, what we got here. Well, yes, the one I've just shown you, the reason I use the graph paper is because one, one full square is one metre square. Um, work however you want, I work in both feet and metres, which confuses the hell out of a lot of people. And even down to what I grew in the polytunnel, you know, that, that was even planned out. Once again, so very, very basic. It doesn't have to be in great detail. But give yourself a plan, which will then give you an order in which you need to do things. Um, plan your beds. So, as you've seen, you know, I did, I've done a mixture. So I planned my raised beds and I planned the soil, which is this, uh, all what's around the polytunnel which is what was here, you know, all this space around here is just open soil. It's not beds. So essentially they ended up being a path along here and a path down there, and peas were in there. These are all potatoes, and this pretty much was all corn. Um, and then, you know, but it doesn't have to be rigid. You don't have to say, well, I've drawn it, therefore that's what it is. Um, but it certainly, certainly is the biggest, single, most important thing you can do is plan your jobs. You know, in doing this, I knew that before my potatoes went in, I had a couple of months, which enabled me to get my raised beds built, filled and planted up. Otherwise, it seems like, it always seems like an unsurmountable task. It seems like you're going to be going on and on and on and you're never going to get anything in the ground. Also, in doing this, this plan here, 
I had my strawberry plants because they'd been donated from another plot holder. So I knew that that was a bed that I needed to get filled pretty sharpish. Um, and then from there I knew that my next planting, because of the time of year, was going to be my brassicas. So I then knew that I needed to fill these beds next. And so on and so on. Um, so it, like I said, it gave me an order of operation and meant that I had goals. And you'd be surprised just filling a, one bed and getting the plants in, putting a line through that on your ledger is such a, a, a morale boost and knowing that that job is done and you know apart from the continual maintenance of weeding you've got a crop next year might be your only crop don't worry about it little and often do what you can when you can um, if like me this year I've had I've got access to, to, to large amounts of plastic and things to cover the ground with in my first year I didn't have any of that but luckily on my site there is somebody who can lend me a rotavator so every six weeks I'd hit it with a rotavator to keep the weeds down this year I'm doing things slightly differently I've covered it with plastic um, there are a lot of people who say oh no you shouldn't do that you've got to do what works for you you really have and once again that kind of thing wants to be in your plan are you going to turn it over every six weeks? Are you going to hoe it every week? Are you going to, um, or are you going to cover it through winter? If that's when you've taken, be joining the channel. He's taken on a plot. He, he spent ages digging it all over, and I'm telling him, look, now you've dug it over, get it covered because you're not planting. It's the wrong time of year, and he didn't. And he spent week after week after week digging and digging and digging and, and weeding. And all I was saying to him is, look, once you've dug it, cover it. Then you don't need to worry about it. And then when it comes to next season, your soil's in good condition. You've dug it, you've fed it, you've covered it. So the soil has, um, has sat quite happily. Uh, just peel back then your plastic or whatever it is you've covered it with um, as you need it. Uh, that way you'll keep the weeds down, lowering your work. Um, so yeah, plan your beds, take into, try and take into account the sun location, plan your buildings, so know where your permanent structures are going to be and what you're going to do around them, because you want to maximise your space, but you also want somewhere where in the height of summer you can sit and get out of the sun, in the height of winter, if like me you go down and still do things in winter, you also want somewhere where you can sit and warm up for five minutes. That's if you're allowed these structures. So plan where they're gonna be. Plan round them. Plan your beds. Are you gonna have raised beds? Are you gonna do like this, you know, with the, with the raised beds? Are you gonna do the proper sort of wartime old school way, which is just gonna be all dirt with, with trodden paths in between? Are you gonna do hybrid like me? Are you going to do polytunnel? Are you going to do greenhouse? Plan where these things are going to go. Even if you haven't got them, plan where they're going to go and keep that space available. Prepare it. Prepare the space. Get it all nice and level. Preparation is key. Um, and then you can move on to the more exciting stuff. Now, bear in mind, all this stuff, it sounds like a massive task. If you've gone down and measured your plot, it's not a massive task. Um, so now we move on to the more exciting stuff, crops, what are you going to grow? You've already seen on my plans last year, I had decided what I was going to grow. Uh, and for the most part, that was, that was stuck to. Um, I didn't get any carrots in, but the beds didn't go to waste. Uh, so plan what you're going to grow. Now me, for example, the kids and the family love broccoli, but I don't grow green calabrese. You can pick that up for 30 pence. I grow purple sprouting broccoli. I grow uh, just sprouting broccoli. Um, I grow the, the, the more expensive end of the options. Um, but bear in mind, the reason these things are usually more expensive is your yield is lower. So for example, for a family of four, one purple sprouting broccoli plant will give us one meal. Um, it won't 
you know, it won't fill the freezer. So you need to factor these things in and you'd be surprised how big plants like that are. Cabbages, for example, can require, and I can't even get it in frame, but they can require two foot of space all the way around them. You need to factor this stuff in. So plan what you're going to build, figure out how much space it's gonna need and start thinking about successive planting. So cabbages in today's atmosphere, you know, environment you can get sometimes two sowings in through with through summer and then you've got your overwintering so your, your spring cabbages um, so start to think about successive planting but don't dwell on it don't get don't overwhelm yourself you just think right I want to get this is what I want to do I want to have a, a collection of beds but in year one I want this bed this bed and this bed That may not sound like a lot, but trust me, if you've got a heavy soil, or you end up poorly, or you know something unforeseen happens, you'd be surprised how much work that turns out to be. So plan your crops. What are you going to grow? Don't worry about buying seeds yet. Um, there's plenty of time. You know, there will always be seeds available for everything all year round you've just got to know where to look um, which kind of leads us on to the next plant so once again I'm going to try and do the list here so you've done your plan you've got your folder or your ledger or your notebook you've planned where everything's going to be uh, your, your beds and your buildings you've planned your crops and you know how much space you need for your crops now it's time to think about where are you going to start. Now that depends on the time of year. That could be, if it's in the height of summer, I kind of wouldn't focus on digging. The ground is going to be rock solid. If it's like this time of year when this video goes up, so September, October, that is the perfect time to be getting an allotment. The weather is in your favour, the light levels are in your favour, the ground condition is in your favour. Sounds silly, but it's easier to dig wet earth, not soaked earth, but wet earth, than it is to dig dry earth. Dry earth is like a rock. Wet earth, you'll be able to get your spade or your fork in a lot easier. Yeah, it's slightly heavier per, you know, per spade full because it's got a water content, but it's a lot easier to get it in. So you plan where you're going to start. If you're doing raised beds, what beds do you need to start from? Like I said on mine, I knew I needed that strawberry bed ASAP, followed by the cabbage beds, because that was the time of year I was starting. So this leads us on to point two. And sort of you could sort of interchange these two points really read books follow your literature do your literature do your homework watch your youtubers if you're watching me trust me there are many 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 other sources out there from um dean's lost the plot to sean james cameron to digging for dinner to my, my, my brain's gone completely blank, but there, there are so many YouTubers out there that can help you out. Um, oh, Muddy Boots is excellent YouTuber. Um, and the best thing about the YouTubers is they will publish videos as I do at a time that is applicable for me for that product. So for example, I'll be next month uh, probably actually in the next couple of weeks I'll be putting my elephant garlic in there'll be a video up about that if that video goes up and you know that I'm sort of mid sort of north of Midlands I'm sort of Hull area um, you can base you know if you're north or south of that whether you should have them in um, or whether you you know my allotment neighbour and whether you need to start thinking about putting these things in. And your books and your YouTubers will tell you that. Last week I published um, two videos, a long one and a short one, 
which is allotment month by month by Alan Buckinghamshire. Excellent book. Uh, many gardeners class it as their Bible. And I've, having had it for a month or so now, I completely understand why. As, a, as an information resource, it is amazing. So you've done your planning. Once you've done your homework, you've done your planning. Now all of this can take place over the course of a couple of days. Sounds like a massive list. It's really not. So in your plan, you've done your beds, you've done or not. You've done your buildings or not. You've done your crops. You've figured out where you're gonna start, what's your priorities. And you've started to read your books and do your homework and follow your YouTubers. Now we get on to sort of some of the questions I've specifically been asked to cover. Uh, or we start to touch upon them and that is sort of where to get your tools from and how to save a bit of money. I personally would say do not buy brand new tools. Yes, they're good, but I guarantee until you know your soil and you've got it all right, you're going to break things. So my biggest, biggest money saving tip is go second hand on your tools. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, Gumtree, even eBay, more prominently, local car boot sales. You'll pick up a full set of tools for a tenner. But don't be, lo don't be lured into thinking, I need this, 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 and this. If you're still just filling beds and, um, and digging, double digging, if you're going straight into the soil, all you need is a fork, a spade, and a rake, a, a soil rake. That's all you need to start. You don't need all the secateurs, the saws, the different types of rakes, different types of hoes. You don't need all that. Yes, it's nice to have, but you can get started and you can get a long way with just a spade and a fork. And like I said, my number one tip for picking those up at a good price is go to your local car boots on a Sunday morning. Um, and then once you've done that, you've got your tools, you're ready to start digging, you want to be thinking, you've got on your plan, you know what you're going to grow, you want to be starting to think about where you're going to get your seeds from. And this is where you can spend a bit of money initially, but save money later. Uh, one of the things I am going to mention is try not to be seduced to putting supermarket leftovers in your plot. So try not to put supermarket potatoes, try not to use tomato seeds, try not to use um, pepper seeds, things like that. There are a couple of reasons. Um, but first and foremost, especially when it comes to things like potatoes, is that farmers don't treat for diseases that allotmenters would have, that would be devastating to allotmenters. Um, they don't treat for blight. They don't heat treat their sets for their onions to stop them blowing. It's, it's no, if 5% if, if of their crop blows and goes to seed, they're not bothered about that. Those, those, those will be sent off to be processed some other way. But to us, if we end up with blight because of a, a, a potato we've got from a supermarket, that can be your entire crop. That can be your entire season's potatoes gone. So try not to be seduced. Um, the other reason is um, primarily due to, is primarily affecting seeds. Um, get a potato or a, uh, not a potato, a tomato or a pepper or a chili and you can eat it and go, oh wow, wow that's really nice, I want to grow them. But what the packet doesn't tell you is that that particular variety is a hybrid. Now without going into it too much, a hybrid is a mating of two different varieties. Um, which eventually, once it's bred and bred and bred and bred, becomes stable. But 
you don't know whether that's stable or not. So you can plant these seeds, but you could end up with something that's true to either the mother or the father, essentially, to put it in, in, in real world terms. And either one or both individually might be completely inedible. Um, in essence, in some instance, could even make you poorly. Um, not wishing to scaremonger, but it's it can happen. Um, but you know, talk to your other plot holders. Find out what they grow. Find out what grows well if you're growing in the soil. Um, you'll also find chances are that they have a wealth of seeds that they've built up through the years or collected through the years that they're willing to give you. Um, but if you're going to buy your seeds, there's a couple of things you can do which will cost you a little bit to start with, but will save you money in the long run. Um, one of the things I'm so happy I did in my first year was I used a company called Real Seed. And what they do is they specialize in uh, heritage or rare varieties. Their seeds are a little bit more pricey, but the beauty of it is because it's heritage. Now, don't be fooled. Heritage doesn't mean old world. Heritage in the um, growing society usually more applies to the fact that the seed from that plant will be true to that plant. So if you grow California Wonder Peppers from real seed, Provided it's not cross-pollinated with something else, which is a video which will come next summer, um, those seeds the, from that plant that you've grown in your first season will remain true to that plant. So you can harvest those seeds from those peppers and regrow them next year. This is where the money saving comes in. You're not buying the same seeds over and over and over again. And technically, the genetics from those seeds will be stable for years. Um, and it's something like say, I'm glad I did in year one, and I'm still saving seeds um, from a lot of my crops because they're from real seed. And, and finally, when it comes to seeds, try and factor in some flowers, um, be it edible flowers or non edible flowers. Walking on your plot in the middle of spring, summer, or even autumn and seeing a burst of colour from a flower is quite the morale boost. Um, sweet peas in spring, um, they smell so nice. Um, then you've got your crocuses in autumn, your daffodils also, also in spring, your summertime, your cornflowers, things like that. Not only are they a big morale boost, but they bring onto your plot something that you desperately need, which is pollinators. You need bees, you need hoverflies, you even need wasps. They are all pollinators, they all help pollinate your plants. And without pollination, 90% of your crops won't grow. If your tomatoes don't get pollinated, they won't grow. Things like that. So try and factor in a couple of flower beds, at least a couple interspersed throughout your plots. Try and get these insects traveling around your plot, which really also factors into this. The third point and possibly the final point for this video is think about growing your own fertilizers. Um, there, are th there are three good ones out there, two you can grow, one you can't, unless you're really lucky. Um, and it's going to sound really weird saying grow your own fertilizer, but, but there's, a, there's, there's, there's some really cracking ones out there. In year one, it's the one that I used, which is comfrey, comfrey tea and, and straight leaves. Um, what you do is you grow about, uh, now technically it's a weed and it, it grows wild and it will grow wild if you leave it in unchecked. But there is a variety, comfrey bocking 14 that doesn't produce seed, or if it does, the seed is sterile. Um, it, it, can only be divide, it can only be spread through root division. Um, get your hands on some Comfrey Bocking 14 and do a nice big bed full. And I do recommend doing it in a contained bed because it will spread. Um, 
but when that's up, let the flowers come, beautiful flowers, let the bees have their bit, then chop it back. You can be quite severe with it, but this isn't a video about care. You can be quite severe with it, chop it back, you chuck it in some water, now this thing stinks like death, but your plants will love it. So chuck it in some water, leave it six to eight weeks, my recommendation, put them in an old, put the leaves in an old pair of tights, that way you can pull the old, pull, pull the leaves out once they've done their bit. And it doesn't get into your watering can and block it up. Um, so you've got comfrey. Your second one is nettles. Nettle tea. Same as comfrey. Trim them back, mash them up if you can, stick them in water let them stew once again in fact all three of these stink like death um, but once again it's a free fertilizer that you can grow quite readily especially if you've got a bit of land that you're not cultivating like, be like behind your sheds or your greenhouses if you're not cultivating that try and introduce some nettles or some comfrey and let it go um, because it's going to save you a lot of money in the long run so nettles are another one, treat them the same as comfrey. And the third and final one that I know of, if you're lucky enough to have access to it, is seaweed. Um, now, it doesn't mean rush down to your nearest beach and pull up all the seaweed you can find. That's actually, I believe, technically illegal in a lot of places. Um, speak to your local councils, they will advise you where to go, when to go, and what to look out for. Um, I think one of the you know the, the, the usual rule is any seaweed that is above the tide line is not going to be a habitat for anything. Um, so generally that's stuff that you can take, but please, please, please check with your local authorities. Um, and even just one bucket of that will pretty much see you all season. Um, but obviously with seaweed it needs a good, good, good wash. You don't want that salt getting into your ground. So you've done all of this planning, you know, all of these points. Um, now you can start digging, but uh, that's something we're going to talk about in a different video. We're not going to go over it in this in this video because even digging, there are so many different ways of doing it, and even no digging. So we're going to leave that for another video. Hopefully, I've hopefully I've stayed on track. Um, but my biggest point I want to get across in this video, do your planning, do your planning, do your homework, check out the YouTubers, um, check out books, allotment month by month, um, and obviously stay subscribed, we will, um, we will bring you as much relevant information at the right time of year as we possibly can. So until next time, I'll see you later.